this is perhaps the easiest uh, easiest job in the world is introducing Tony. Um, we have a full crowd on a, on a stormy night, and uh, that's that's uh, entirely due to, to Tony, I think. Uh, people would have stayed home. Uh, otherwise, one of the few people that that is known. Oh, everybody's cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and silence your phones. It's going to be storming tonight, so uh, we, can, we can get that out of the way now. But one of the few people you can you can call by the first name, and uh, uh, everybody knows who you're talking about for the culture. I'm ready to hear now. So. <laughs> Everybody's going to jump every now and then. Maybe some vibrations in their pockets. Um, Tony is so uh, famous or perhaps infamous. I just heard that an entire Master Gardener Association in, in South Carolina has disbanded rather than have him come down to the their lifestyle. There's uh, probably 150 uh, plants on the slide, so I'm going to get out of Tony's way and let him come uh, talk about uh, some of the fantastic native plants that he works with. Yeah, I appreciate so many people coming out tonight, and so many familiar faces, always neat. Uh, it's sort of a little different talk for me. I don't get a chance to speak very often about native plants. And this is an area that's very passionate uh, for me because I, I was raised not too far down the roads here, off Ridge Road. And as a child, I spent a lot of time out in the woods because that was, you know, I wasn't a very social person. I'm very much of an introvert, so I'm much better uh, out in the woods dealing with plants. So I remember back then Ridge Road area was very undeveloped. Uh, I don't know how many of you know this West Raleigh section, but Francis Lacey School, there was a dirt road from there uh, back uh, when we lived on there. So we had a lot of room to go roam and roam down by what is now Crabtree Valley before Crabtree Valley was there. So really amazing times. Uh, some of the neat things I remember is uh, I used to go out with a uh, a uh, wonderful lady, Margaret Reed, we would go out collecting wildflowers from construction sites. One of the last uh, sites we went together was South Hills Mall, for anybody that knows that area. It was incredible areas full of Adamasco lilies and yellow lady slippers uh, before they bulldozed it and put in a uh, shopping center. Really quite amazing. So, you know, I've since traveled a lot around the world, but I think of the probably 80 plus trips we've done probably 85 to 90 percent of those have been in the U.S. because, well, not just the food's better, the hotels are better, the travel restrictions are better, but I'm just fascinated by native plants. I was very influenced by the, the late Richie Bell of UNC Botanic Gardens because he really, his motto was conservation through propagation. And I really took that to heart because I, when you're coming up and you're trying to find a lot of these plants, they simply aren't available. And I remember as a kid when I used to mail order plants. I was a mail order when I was probably five, six years old. Uh, just a lot of the plants that you would see in the woods weren't available. And I said, one day I want to grow up and be able to make a lot of these neat plants available, teach people about them. Now I'm going to use sort of a broad definition of natives tonight, because natives to me, we're going to call North American natives. So it may be some of that in Mexico. It's, geopolitical borders really don't mean a whole lot. That's uh, yeah, I've tried to explain it to some of the people on the uh, North Carolina Rare Plant Committee because they think if they drew a border in North Carolina, it's rare just because there's one plant on this side of the line and there might be a million just on the other side of the line. There's a lot of myths about natives. I, I remember back when uh, I first got into this, a lot of people would say, well, I don't, don't want to grow native plants because they're ugly. And if you looked at what people were propagating, it was ugly because nurseries tend to propagate the plants that propagate the fast, which are what we call weeds. <laughs> and there's a lot of great native weeds that really are. They grow extremely well. There's also a myth that native plants are better adapted to the area in which they're native. Simply not true. That is a 100% lie. It's still being perpetuated today, over and over again. Native plants are not any better adapted. If native plants were better adapted, how could you have endangered natives? 
You couldn't. Wouldn't be possible. How could you have invasive exotics if natives are better adapted? You can't. It simply doesn't hold up to logic. Native plants are not better adapted. The majority of them evolved 100,000 to 500,000 million years ago. You think the climate wasn't different then? Very different. They are not better adapted. Another myth. Native plants grow in the wild where they grow their best. Not true. They only grow where they will persist without human intervention, not where they grow the best. Very often we bring things in, put them in the exact optic conditions. They're much better off. So we want to celebrate natives that are great garden plants. We want to bring them into cultivation, again, conservation through propagation. When I was on the North Carolina Rare Plant Conservation Committee, it was all about conserving property, conserving the plants, what they call in situ. Okay, that's great. But if you believe that climate changes, if you believe in climate change, the worst thing you can do is preserve the plant where it currently grows. That makes the least sense because climate is going to change. The best thing you can do is to preserve it ex situ, to propagate it, to spread it all over the world. The more you get the plants out, the better chance we have to preserve those genetics. We hear now that grow natives because the insects and the animals all are adapted to that. And that they get their nectar from this and they only eat this and they only eat that. That's not true either. But it's still taught over and over and over again you hear that. The recent book came out by Doug Talamy. Oh, bringing nature home. Well, he starts out with bringing diversity in, which is great, and then he gets into native plants, native pollinators must have native plants. Hogwash. It doesn't hold up to any logic. If you look at the number of plants and things that have gone extinct in the last hundred years, it's a massive number. But have all the pollinators and, and animals depended on them gone extinct? No. Nature adapts. There's some really great studies. I cited some of them in our last year newsletter. Go read. Uh, down in the Gulf Coast, Sapium sabifrom, the poster boy of bad invasives. Somebody actually did a count of the wildlife that was depending on the areas that were full of sapium. It's like tenfold where it was in the pristine native areas. A couple really great new papers just came out. Plant animals. Insects, they really do not care. When Doug did his book, he went into a wonderful native plant garden, full and flowing and very healthy, and counted the insects. There were piles of insects. Then he went next door to a mow and blow lawn and counted the insects. And of course, there's nothing there. But instead of going and saying, all right, we're going to take five Asclepias from America and five from China, we're going to see which pollinators occur. That would have been a statistically valid scientific study. And what they would have found based on our experiences in the garden, insects don't care. So grow natives because they're great plants. They happen at this point in time to be in our backyard. Great reason to grow them. But this other stuff, no, no, no. no. It's, like, it's like marketing hype with nurseries. It just it doesn't hold up to the realities. Grow them because they're wonderful. So let's look at some plants. Let's. Uh, I want to start with a group of natives that have undergone as much resurgence thanks to a little uh, genetic breeding uh, as any plant around, and that's the coneflowers, the echinaceas. We know them and love them. We've got them native here in North Carolina, but some some interesting things happen. Up till probably 15 years ago, we had the purple and the white. That's all we had. In, around here anyway. And a friend of ours in Chicago, Jim All, said, well, you know, we got this really ugly yellow one out here in the Midwest called Echinacea Paradox. It's about five foot tall, real lanky thing. What if we bred that on the Echinacea purpurea? What would we get? Well, he turned out to create an entire color range that we never had before. And then every breeder then around the world began breeding. And I want to just share some of the ones that have done really well with us today. This is uh, one called Aloha. This is coming out of a program in Oregon. Uh, blooms come out this beautiful buttery yellow and then age to a, a almost parchment white. Um, a lot of the echinaceas are, are really quite incredible. 
This is salts or red. This is coming out of the ball breeding program in Illinois. Very well in our test. Only about a foot tall. That's one clump in our garden. Massive, massive numbers of flowers. Uh, tomato soup. Love this. This is a tall one. This is over three feet tall. It's like three and a half feet tall. Flowers which are four inches across and wonderfully fragrant. Anybody ever smelled echinaceas? Not all echinaceas are fragrant, but the breeders now are actually starting to breed for fragrance. Pretty incredible. Now the key on planting echinaceas, I've got to tell you this, because people plant these and they die. Number one, soil's got to be well drained. Echinaceas are prairie plants. They must have well drained. Do not plant these late in the year. Anything after September, they're gonna, the chances of overwintering are gonna go down to nothing. When you plant them, cut all the flowers off. These things are flowering machines. If you put them in the ground and do not cut the flowers off, they will actually flower and flower and flower and never develop a crown to overwinter. And then next year, you will have nothing except wasted money. So when you plant them for the first week or two, cut all the flowers off. Let them form a crown, then they can bloom all they want to. Hot coral, isn't that incredible? That's one plant. Flowers come out orange with red and they age to purple. I love that. I think that is absolutely fascinating. And these are just ones that have done well in our trials. We've probably been through about 80 cultivars that did not make the cut for tolerance uh, of garden conditions. Love this, solar flare. This was bred down in Dahlonega, Georgia. I love this because the stems are jet black and the flowers are this weird peachy apricot color. I, I, there's only two that have the black stems, a trait I just absolutely love that really stands out well in the gardens. And then the doubles. Does that, that doesn't even look like an echinacea. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It started out with a couple of sports that actually sported pink in a field, just a mutation. Then they were able to breed the mutation and now we have an incredible color range. This is milkshake. Done very well in our trials, about 20 inches. We get really good rebloom on these. If you cut the flower heads off, they'll rebloom up through September for us. Really extraordinary. And my favorite, hot papaya. Love this. Comes out in orange and then ages to almost this brilliant scarlet red. Uh, just an amazing plant. Uh, probably about 24 or 30 inches on this one. And I took this. I don't know how to use Photoshop, so these are not color enhanced at all. These are. Uh, the real colors. Of the doubles, uh, of the pinks, this is my favorite. This is Secret <coughs> Affairs coming out of uh, Terra Nova program in Oregon. Three foot tall, very sturdy stems. A lot of the early uh, echinaceas, the doubles, had very weak stems. They'd fall over. This has stood up incredible to uh, our summer rains. And Secret Glow. I mean, again, just imagine where echinaceas were 15 years ago and what has happened to them just in the last 15 years. Quite extraordinary. The uh, butterflies still absolutely adore these. I've seen no difference on the, the hybrids in terms of which ones the butterflies uh, go to because the nectar is still there. I'm really excited. The other group that we're really excited about are the baptisias. Uh, I began collecting baptisias back in the... Uh, 90s, uh, going to all the Baptisia sites around the country, uh, getting gathering genetics so we could begin a program to see what we could do. And Baptisias are fascinating because the, the monograph, does everybody know what a monograph is? Okay, a monograph is something that's written about one genus of plants by somebody with absolutely no social life and no friends. <laughs> So the Baptisia monograph was written in 1939 by a woman who obviously had never had a date, uh, Mary Maxine Laris. And it was incredible. It's, it's like a hundred pages of every Baptisia known to exist and where it is. So we took this in hand and went out. It turns out Baptisias are not eaten by cows because pretty much everywhere Baptisias grow are now cows. So you get to hop over the barbed wire, run out there, dodge the cows, grab some cuttings or some seed and get back. So we got back, we got all these genetics from Canada all the way down to the Gulf Coast, all the way east, and then began mixing them together. This is our first introduction from those genetics. This is Baptisia, one we named Blue Towers. It's a cross between the East Coast Australis and Baptisia alba. 
uh, Alba is an amazing plant, uh, very wide from Canada all the way down to, to Mexico. It has very tall spikes, so that was that allowed us to get a taller spike than Australis has, but get the blue, good, good blue color out of Australis. This is our white counterpart to that, ivory towers. You see the wonderful charcoal stems. That's something you find in some populations of Baptisia alba. Uh, uh, and we we're able to make this selection that's four and a half feet tall and just absolutely stunning. And what we're looking for as breeders is good separation between the flowers and the foliage, which uh, on some of the hybrids I've seen was not particularly good. One a little shorter was this beautiful yellow using Baptista spherocarpa, which is a species native to primarily Texas, Oklahoma, goes a little bit into Alabama, Arkansas, but this is about a three-footer. This is one we named Blonde Bombshell, and this is it in our garden in full bloom. And typically full bloom for these is uh, around late April, depending on the year. Pretty, pretty amazing uh, a plant. Incredibly drought tolerant. The neat thing about Baptisias we saw in the wild is we can find them growing uh, beside cactus, and yet in another area we can find them growing in a bar ditch under a foot of water. <laughs> That's about as durable and as tolerant as, as any plant you can imagine. And then we have bicolors. The bicolors fascinate me because uh, Larry, she talked about those in her monograph. And then in, back in the late 80s, there was a paper published out of uh, University of Texas talking about all the bicolors down there in, uh, in northeast Texas. So I called up the fellow that wrote the article and I said, I want to come down and see these. I want to take cuttings because the, the bicolors were just incredible. And I said, well, I'll call you in April, and you let me know if they're a flower, and I'll fly down. So I called him up, and I said, all right, we're ready to come down to the end flower. So he calls me back a couple days later and said, I have bad news. Okay. Uh, they're all dead. What, dead? What, what do you mean dead? Oh, well, the farmer, they ran these farm fields, and they sprayed all the fence rows with Roundup. They're all dead. <laughs> He said, but good news, we have herbarium specimens. <laughs> okay, you want herbarium specimens? That's a, that's a fancy word for a dead plant. <laughs> I said, well, these were known for 60 years. You mean to tell me in 60 years nobody had taken cuttings and propagated these? No, but we have dead plants we can show you. <laughs> Thanks a whole lot. So we had to go to nearby areas, gather the genetics, and then come back and recreate these. And this is uh, one done by one of my traveling companions, Hans Hansen. This is one he named Cherry's Jubilee. And this is just the start of recreating all these natural uh, bicolor hybrids. Uh, and really, the photos of the plants of the wild were truly extraordinary. Another group I, I'm really fond of are the blue stars, or Amsonias. Uh, many of you may have grown, there's a couple now that are very common in the trait. This is some that isn't. This is Amsonia rigida. This is a Gulf Coast native. This is a four and a half foot tall, bright cinnamon red stems. And the flowers are nearly pure white. It is an amazing plant. There's so many more than the one or two that are out in the trade. The really neat one that was found by a friend of mine, Bob McCartney, down in, uh, in Woodlanders Nursery. He's going through Georgia in the Sand Hills and finds this ground cover. And he's like, well, what is this? This is an Amsonia, but it flowers laying flat on the ground. And so we, I told him it needed a name, so we called it Georgia Pancake. It's one of the most elegant ground covers ever. It does flower. The flowers is a light blue, uh, only about three or four inches tall. And then you just have this absolute gorgeous ground cover the rest of the season. Just, just stunning and, and beautiful yellow uh, color when it goes dormant in fall. This is probably going to wind up being a new species as soon as we can find somebody to uh, study that and publish it. Clematis. Everybody grows Clematis, but everybody grows the big mailbox hybrids. They don't grow the cool stuff. This is Clematis ochroleuca. Fascinating plant native to Durham. <laughs> and up into Virginia, but almost no one knows this. I took this photo growing at my friend's garden in Minnesota. It's completely hardy in Zone 4, Minnesota from Durham. It's pretty amazing. Matures out around 12 inches tall. Beautiful bloom in spring. We get a little rebloom in the summer. And Oberluca is named for the wonderful seed pods. And we don't generally 
think a lot about Clematis seed pods, but when that finishes, it's extraordinary. Full sun or light shade. In the wild, it grows in sort of an open, scrubby shade. But in full sun, that's where it's really glorious. So much nicer in an area other than where it grows in the wild. But a plant everybody should grow. There's so many wonderful natives. Clematis versicolor. This is in our garden. I, I would not be without this plant. I love this. It flowers nonstop all summer long. It's a sort of a scrambler. It'll scramble maybe four feet. We've got it growing over top of a punchy cactus. It is absolutely gorgeous. It makes the punches look like they're flowering all year. Just one of many natives. There's uh, three new species just getting ready or just have been named. And there's, there's several more in the pipeline, all discovered right here in the United States, recently. One of our greatest all-time natives, Vigilia Marylandica, a native from Maryland all the way down. We found this in Louisiana. It's an amazing plant. If that were native to Japan or China, we'd all grow it. <laughs> I, I love to tell the story. We've been in business about five years, and I get this call from Hillier's Nursery in England. I love sharing this story. And Hillier's like one of the most famous nurseries in the world. And they said, we understand that you're growing Spigelia. Sure. Well, we'd like to buy 25. Well, back then, 25 was a lot for us. So, so I, I sold them my entire crop, sent them off to England. A few years later, they called back. They said, we'd like 100 of them. you like, what? Are you kidding me? I said, give me a year. I'll get them propagated. We did. We sent them over there. So a decade or so goes by. So I'm over one day in England. I'm driving down the road. And I look out, and there's Hillier's Nursery. And I'm like, well, let me pull in here and see if they still have the spigelia. So I pulled in, and you know, I, I introduced myself. I said, you got some spigelias from us. Yes, yes. Well, do you still grow them? Well, why, yes. Can I see them? <laughs> why, yes. So they walk over and opened up a greenhouse door. <laughs> he said, yes, we sold two million units this spring. <laughs> Is, is something wrong with this picture? <laughs> it's our plant. There's two million of them in Europe in one year? Are you kidding me? It, things like this fascinate me. We do not appreciate plants that are right here in our own backyard. And in this case, one of the most incredible perennials we grow. Now, of course, we have one that they don't have. We have this plant, Spigelia alabamensis. Is that incredible or what? That's taken in our rock garden. This is a little thing three inches tall. Found in one little area of Alabama down in the uh, uh, Bibb County. One of the most incredible rock garden plants imaginable. But it's on the endangered species list, which means that we can't sell it across state lines, which means they can never get it unless they come here and smuggle it back in their <laughs> suitcases. But what an incredible native. In, Unfortunately, laws are not made to keep plants, uh, to distribute plants. They're made to make plants go extinct. They're made to preserve them so that people get grant money to go out and count them in the wild and rub their hands together and make them feel good, uh, which is really a shame because this plant needs to be in every single rock garden. It's, it's that, I mean, damn, that's just incredible for a Southeast native. Uh, Stokesy is a plant many people know, uh, but most people know them by the seed strains, and the seed strains are frankly not particularly fabulous. Uh, for years I didn't know anything about this plant. Come to find out, it grows in the wild with pitcher plants. I was like, oh wow, that's pretty interesting. It is incredibly drought tolerant, but man, you want to see it really grow, put it near some water. Now, normally it's flat and sort of floppy. Well, this was found by a customer of ours, Peachy Saxon, a florist down in Mississippi. Found this, popped it up in her yard. It's almost 20 to 22 inches tall, very rigidly upright, a very different form. We see some tall forms as we go down through Georgia and down through Mississippi. And this is the longest blooming one. This one blooms most of the summer. This is called Peachy's Pick. And if you're going to grow one Stokesia, absolutely the one to grow. Um, a plant I love and a genus I love, this is the genus Vernonia, or ironweeds. Ironweeds suffer because of the name weed. They're not weeds. They're marvelous garden plants. This is one of my favorite. This is Vernonia lettermanii, an incredible
incredible plant with looks just like an Amsonia hubrectia in foliage and these amazing, amazing flowers. I just, I love this. And just a haven for insects in the, in the summer bark. Uh, one of the best species. Love goldenrods. I know that's sacrilege to some people. You know, the old, uh, for, for years people thought goldenrod caused hay fever and until we found out that was a smear campaign by the National Ragweed Association <laughs> to hide the blame. And we began growing a lot of golden rods, and there's some serious weeds in the golden rod family. There's some, I mean, Solidago canadensis, major weed. I don't care if it's native, it's a weed. <laughs> it's the number one invasive in New Zealand now is our native Solidago canadensis. But then you hit these incredible ones. I was introduced to this one out in Missouri. This is Solidago drumadi. This is the cliff golden rod. 18 inches tall, three foot across, doesn't run, tight clump absolutely phenomenal and almost totally unknown in the trade blooms in august and early september plant i would not garden without the other really interesting one is this this is this is one of those great names this is solidago pasa flossicosa <laughs> you cannot say that three times fast this is actually a shrubby goldenrod this has got a trunk it only grows about two feet tall, but it has a woody trunk. Now, of course, the taxonomists decided the goldenrods couldn't have trunks, so now they've tried to move it out of goldenrod into, like, chrysocoma. But to me, that's still a solid ego. It looks like a solid ego. It blooms like a solid ego. I'm going to leave it there. But a really cool plant. You'll probably never see this. We tried selling it. I think I sold five the entire year. But it is a very, very good garden plant. Um, more of the what we call DYCs. Everybody know the technical term DYC? Damn yellow composite. <laughs> uh, this is another great native. This is Helianthus angustifolius. Now, two things about Helianthus angustifolius. Number one is called swamp sunflower because it grows in the wild in swamps. Look where we have this growing. <laughs> That's not in the swamp. It's absolutely fabulous. Well, this plant got sent over to New Zealand. Boom. And when they did, they shrunk it. When it went over there, it was eight foot tall. When it came back, it was 18 inches tall. And they gave it the wonderful name of Lowdown. And that's this form. So again, if, if, you got, if, if that's too tall for you, and I do like tall, but this is a much, much greatly reduced version and really a superb plant. Again, what's a weed in one man's garden is a treasure in another. This was actually found by a customer of ours. This is a uh, poke weed or poke salad, as we used to call them. And this is a golden one called Sunny Side Up. A fabulous plant. Now, in Europe, our native poke weed is treasured. It is one of their favorite plants in the garden. And now, once we put yellow foliage on it with those wonderful purple berries, it is absolutely amazing in fall. And pretty much the weeds will now be yellow instead of green. So a lovely addition to, uh, to this. You know, again, you know, again, not all natives are everybody's cup of tea. Just because they're native doesn't make them good. Just because they're not doesn't make them bad. I had a call a couple years ago. I did a little uh, NPR segment on uh, climate change. And there was just this study out that said that because of climate change, uh, Poison ivy is growing better than it ever has. It's just taking over, and they wanted some comments on how horrible this was. And I said, why is that horrible? Well, it's obvious. I said, no. Poison ivy is a native plant. That means that climate change is causing native plants to grow better than they ever have. What is, what is wrong with this picture? We should be celebrating. We should be happy. Oh, man, that messed with their heads. <laughs> Uh, there's so many native flocks, hard to even know where to start. This has uh, got to be one of my favorites. This is uh, found by a friend of ours uh, down in Mississippi, uh, Karen Partless. She was walking by the railroad track one night, which I understand is a popular pastime in Mississippi. <laughs> and she looks at all the flocks blooming, it's just normally purple, and she sees this white one. And like a good nurseryman, she, when she gathered up cuttings and took it back to her little mail order nursery and she propagated uh, a couple of them and she sent them out to a couple of people to test before she went out of business. 
and there was only two of them that got out. One of them happened to go to our friend uh, M.K. Ram over in Hillsboro. M.K., about a year or two later, calls me up and said, did you get this flock? I said, no, never heard of it. Brought me a piece. We, grew, we were blown away because it, no mildew, it flowers a month earlier than Phlox maculata, but it spreads. There's no such thing ever existed. So I called her up. I called up Karen. I said, we'd like to name this because we think it's really neat. We want a good southern name, so we called it Mini Pearl. <laughs> it's now probably the number one selling Phlox in the entire world. I had breeders from Paul Seed, big, huge mega seed company, come a couple of years ago. They're looking for new genetics for their breeding. And I said, what do you breed? And they list off the stuff, flocks. I said, I got the flocks for you. I took them over and said, this is mini pearl. Oh, we got that from me five years ago. That's the best flocks ever introduced. Found by the railroad tracks in Mississippi by a gardener that had their eyes on That's pretty darn impressive. So amazing, amazing flocks. This is another one found by a customer of ours in Tennessee, Gina Pruitt. Gina has an area where Phlox grows wild, Phlox uh, paniculata. This particular one this is about four and a half feet tall. It's pretty tall, small flowers, but hundreds on each head, hundreds. She noticed that all the butterflies went to this one, didn't go to any of the other phloxes if they were in blue, always went to this one. So she shared cuttings. We wound up uh, getting the plant named after. It's incredible. Phlox Gina, if you hadn't grown it, it has more uh, uh, nectar than, than any other phlox that we can imagine. It's an incredible plant and have never seen a drop of mildew on this thing. Quite extraordinary. Native Phlox Novalis. I'm coming back to Caswell County one day and the whole hillside is just a blaze of color. Phlox Novalis. Incredible plant. Comes in everything from pinks to blues to whites called sand flocks in the garden three four inches tall beautiful evergreen foliage can't say enough great things already in full flower in the garden grow flocks of valence it's just amazing the amorphous i used to go over to the botanic garden chapel hill and i'm just fascinated by the amorphous they've got a wonderful collection over there this has got to be my favorite of the genus this is more of a midwest this is amorpha canescence it's uh two feet tall it's a little, it's sort of a perennially shrubby thing. This is it in uh, late spring, early summer. There's a close-up. Just absolutely exquisite. Loves bone dry. Plant it with the cactus. Just an extraordinary plant. I, I just can't imagine being without this. It's called lead plant. And there's tall ones, short, there's shorter ones. They're really amazing. Wonderful Texas native, Anissa Campus. You want hummingbirds in your garden, put an Anissa Campus. Unbelievable. Three foot tall. Our oldest cat, when he was young, he would actually sleep underneath the Anissa Campus. And when he got hungry, he didn't have to go in for food. He just stuck his hand up, grabbed the hummingbird, ate it, and went back to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I'm not making this up. <laughs> Extraordinary plant, incredibly drought tolerant. I just can't imagine a summer garden for insects without it. Garas, wonderful native gar all the way down to the Gulf Coast, either white or occasionally pink. I saw this one, I thought, there's somebody has photoshopped that. That cannot actually look like that. Got the plant in, and I took that picture. That, that is Gara Rosie Jane, selection of our native Gara Lithimera. Extraordinary where gars have become. Uh, again, need good drainage, plant up early in the season, like the echinaceas. Cut them back first couple times, get a crown developed, then they're going to be absolutely fine in the garden. Our native hibiscus, they're native all through the triangle here. You can drive on the roadsides and see them, typically in white, occasionally you'll see some pink. Gardeners begin breeding, they begin selecting and they're looking for any more better colors, better height, amazing. This is just a few. All hibiscus machutus hybrids, one native species, not even a cross. This is cranberry crush. Isn't that incredible? I mean, the flowers, eight to 10 inches across. These are our natives. Uh, they, grow in, they grow in marshes. They grow on dry ground and grow pretty darn well. Heart crop, look at that. Is that incredible color? That's like a black red. Again, 
again, just just idea of the colors of these. Heights can range anywhere from three foot to five foot, or actually even taller on some, uh, depending on the selection. Just amazing group. Another of the mallows that I fell in love with when I was down in Texas. This is basically a prostrate hibiscus. This is the genus Calroe. It's a basically a mallow that runs along the ground. It forms a wonderful rootstock, spreads out, blooms, and then shrinks back up. Absolutely, I would not be without this. This is Calroe in Volucrata. In Volucrata itself is more of a wine red. Then you have this in Volucrata. Uh, tenuissima, which is a uh, purple, and then in Volucrata uh, Linera Loba, which is white. So you have three different color forms, and they begin to integrate. Just an amazing ground cover for, for hot baking. The skull caps. And again, an amazing group. I can't call them showy, but they're really fascinating. Of all the skull caps we've grown, and that's a lot, this is the single best one. This is Scutellaria Ogilbuki. Is anybody growing Scutellaria Okamuki? This is a Georgia uh, skull cap. It's the Indian name, the Okamukis. This is incredible. 20 inches tall, it blooms nonstop all summer. Pretty much any growing conditions we put it in, from a filtered shade to full sun, it's absolutely extraordinary. There's a plant that if you saw this in the wild, nobody would ever grow it. Because in the wild, where it grows in deep shade, it typically has one flower. And one flower is about the size of a pinhead. But when you take it out of the shade and you put it in sun, like we did, this is what our native Euphorbia corallata looks like. Native to every state east of the Mississippi, and yet totally unknown in gardens. I showed this in a talk. I had another speaker from Ireland, Helen Dillon. She came up to me after she said, that's my favorite garden plant. It is the best performer in Ireland. Well, it also is here, if anybody would try it. This is a collection from Goldsboro. We named Carolina Snow. That is one plant blooming for months in the summer. It's like baby's breath, except it lives. <laughs> we call it redneck baby's breath. It's, it's absolutely a phenomenal native. The amazing, the amazing aspens. Oh my God, it's, it's just an incredible group. This is, whoops, sorry. This is Astropilosis. This is a very widespread plant, but nobody grows this. It's beautiful in flower, makes a clump about two foot tall, but after frost, after the flowers fade, it looks even cooler. It's called frost aspen because it's like this beautiful dried arrangement in your garden. I've never seen another plant like this. And this is a a collection we made down in Alabama. Just extraordinary plant. And then we have climbing asters. We have asters that, that, that run. That, they've been watching too many kudzu movies. <laughs> Aster carolinianus, native right here in the Old North State. An amazing plant. Uh, flowers in uh, October for us. This is it in our garden. Extraordinary. It's seven to eight foot tall it climbs. Now, the evil empire of taxonomy has said these are no longer asters, you know. Europe got all the asters. They had this big divorce, and it was not pretty. And we got stuck with ample asters, symphotricheums, and I'm sorry, an aster is an aster. I know it when I see it. Like some other things, you know it when you see it. I know that. A great plant. Grape ivy. I grew grape ivy when I used to grow house plants, hanging baskets. Do you know we have a native grape ivy in the southeast? This is it. This is Trifoliata. An absolutely extraordinary grape ivy. The leaves feel like rubber. It looks completely tropical. Native from here down to Texas. It's an incredible plant. It's native all the way up into Missouri. This is a zone 5 grape ivy. Beautiful black fruit, very easy to grow, and yet nobody knows it. Bleeding hearts, enough centrists. For years I tried growing the material in the trade, which I think is from Wisconsin. Well, you know what things in Wisconsin look like in our summers? Not particularly good. They're ready to hop back on the train. So I'm up in Virginia in the shale barrens uh, one year. I'm in this area called something like Hell's Furnace. And it's, 
it's it's just it's baking in these areas. There, there's just it's just incredible the plants that withstand this. Well, here is bleeding heart in full baking sun. This area reportedly gets up 110 degrees every summer pretty regularly. So I said, well, I'm going to try this one. This one might grow for us. So we brought it back home. We planted it in our full sun berm with cactus. This picture was taken in mid-August in the middle of a week of 100 degree temperatures in full baking sun. If you have not tried this and you like Dicentra, this is one we named after a nearby resort area called the Dolly Sod. It's a really interesting area too. But absolutely amazing. Blooms non-stop for us from April till October. Does not slow down. That's pretty extraordinary for a native. I like big tropical looking plants. So it's always very cool when you can find one of those that's native. And this is a Silphium. This is Silphium terabithanaceum. Great name. The leaves feel like zero grit sandpaper. It's an incredible plant. This is it on our patio. Looks completely tropical. It's hardy in northern Minnesota. It's an extraordinary plant. Can't imagine being without that in the full sun garden. The coral bells, what a resurgence they've gone through by mixing just a couple of species together, our native Americana with Heuchera velosa. We've got things like frosted violet. Cajun fire. This one's done very well for us in plenty of sun. Delta Dawn, another one that's performed very well in our trials. Citronelle, one of my absolute favorites. These are evergreen. They look the same in January as they do in July. Now, not all the cultivars are good. You've got to get the right genetics, and that's why we do so many trialing on these. But there are just extraordinary uh, plants. Then somebody really wanted to get kinky with plants, so they got a tiarella and a coral bell in the room together, cut out the lights, put on a little very white. <laughs> Next thing you know, we got a eucarella. And the first eucarellas were pretty ugly, then they took the new hippers and new eucarellas and redid it, and we got things like stoplight. Check that picture in our garden, that's a spring photo. Pretty darn incredible. Or solar flare, love this one. This, this one, just to get the color gets better, is it gets hotter, which is pretty amazing for a, a new group of plants. Our native northern sea oaks, we now got this beautiful variegated form called river mist. And yes, it does seed uh, mostly variegated, uh, maturing out about two, two and a half feet tall. I mean, the whole group of carrots, I could do a whole talk on carrots. I've sort of gone carrots mad. This is our North Carolina native carrot seabernia. Four inches tall. You could lay down in this. It is so soft, so absolutely gorgeous. Looks great through the winter time. I, I can't imagine a, a better plant than this. Or longer leaves, carrots Appalachica. There, there's literally dozens of fabulous carrots. These are great foods for wildlife. It's just, just plants that should be in every single garden. Some in sun and some for shade. Carrots Laxacomus, a beautiful southeast native with almost a glaucous blue. One's a very nice plant. These are not weedy. These are just fantastic uh, for the garden floor. Oh my goodness, ferns. Oh, wow. I fell in love as a kid with this. This was native on our property in West Raleigh, the native adiantum pedatum, uh, the wonderful northern maiden here. And then I later I fell in love with this one, adiantum capillus veteris. An amazing, amazing plant because it is circumpolar. This plant is native on every single continent except, I believe, New Zealand. Native on all of them. Same species. We only have one population in North Carolina down in Lake Waccamaw, but uh, it's amazing. This is, I believe, this is from the Alabama population, incredible form we call the Alabama lace. Same species when we collected in northern Florida called fan dams. Exact same plant. The variation's incredible. We collected this in Crete. Guess what? It goes summer dormant in Crete. Same species. California's native. It goes summer dormant there. Same species. Just different ecological variants. Pretty amazing. A wonderful native Calanthes linosa. A great southeast native. Wonderful little evergreen fern for sun. 
for sun. This grows with cactus. It's so, so fabulous. It's a little 8 to 10 inch fern. And this has to be one of my favorites. Dropters Ludovic, I mean Australis. It's a hybrid with our uh, Dropters Ludoviciana. With a name like Australis, you'd think it's from Australia. No! It's native to North Carolina. But it was, and Australis, of course, in Latin means from the south which means it was found by botanists from New York. <laughs> Beautiful thing. Four feet tall in the wild, it grows in wet, swampy shade. And here it is in dry, gravelly sand. Looking absolutely incredible. So it's pretty amazing. I'd always wanted to grow ostrich fern after going up north and seeing them in all the ditches. And I failed miserably because it hates our summers. And then we found this form. This is called the king. This is the form to grow if you want ostrich fern. Absolutely incredible. And ostrich fern spreads. It, it suckers. It's, it, it makes a huge colony. Beautiful in the spring and summer, but I love it in the wintertime. It's one of the few that instead of hiding the spores on the back of the leaves like most ferns does, it, it's like I'm proud of my spores. I'm going to put them on its own frond, and I'm going to leave them up there all winter for everybody to see. It's absolutely incredible in the wintertime to come out in January and you've got the fern out there, you know, showing off its sexual organs. It's really <laughs> a pretty cool thing. I like off green fern. The group of two dwarfs, the dentarians. I love this group. I don't know why. It's probably because they won't sell. Uh, they don't like things like that. Uh, this is a tooth wart thing because, again, people used to chew on it when they were having dental work done. They've now moved all the dentarians into the group cardamines. Damn cardamines, but uh, I still call them dentarians. This is diphyllum. This is a beautiful native. This happens to be a form I collected down in, uh, in Alabama. Great ground cover. Wintertime. Covers the ground when everything is brown. You've got mulch. Put some dentarian. It's incredible. How about this? This is native all the way up and down from, from Minnesota all the way down to the Gulf Coast. This is uh, Cardamony de Glacia. This is it in flower in our garden today. It normally starts around mid February. It blooms with the hellebores. Eight to ten inches tall. How many people are growing this? It's extraordinary. Ordinary. I mean, I, I can't imagine a garden without it. It's totally carefree. By May, it's gone. It's gone. You won't see it again until next year. Just, just incredible. It's plant. This is Dentaria angusta. This is a form I collected down in Alabama. Why does nobody grow this? This is also just wrapping up its bloom. It's been in bloom for two months in the middle of winter. Six inches tall. Just extraordinary little plant. Or even smaller. This is a teeny tiny form of Dentaria luciniana we found up in uh, in Virginia. This is so near, we named this one Dental Floss. <laughs> it's, it seemed appropriate. Mm -hmm. Just cute as a button, two inches tall. It's a little dwarf rock gardening thing. Again, I'll put that in the catalog eventually. I'll probably sell three <laughs> if I'm lucky. But man, it's such a cool native. I love these. All of these are spring ephemerals. The wonderful Viola potatoes, our native violas, you can find them on the roadsides if you travel throughout the southeast, and yet very few people have them in the gardens. And some forms are better than others, I will tell you. This is a form we found at an old abandoned church uh, where it had been graded in Alabama. This blooms nonstop all summer. Normally they're one bloom. This thing is incredible. We'll get this named and get this out one day. Uh, two inches tall. They're not weedy. They're not like the weedy violets. They're extraordinary. They range in colors from white to purples to these wonderful bicolors. This is the late Don Jacobs, Eco Artist Palette. And this one's actually in tissue culture. This is produced and sold by the thousands. Should be sold by the tens of thousands. It's just cute as a button and be flowering very soon for us. The group of uh, a serums. I, I'm in love with the serums, especially uh, this is a serum speciosum. This is, looks like our native, Aerifolia, which is in, in Wake County. This one is only native in three counties in central Alabama. Now what I like about it, in addition to the leaves that smell like licorice with crushed, are the flowers. 
which is extraordinary. Oh my God, I love this plan. I got one 20 years ago. We threw it right in the tissue culture lab. I said, people need to have this. This is amazing. Now, if you cling to the old, uh, there's an old genus called Hexastylus. It was never a valid genus, but the, the botanists in the southeast cling to it really tight because uh, they somehow think that these are different from the serums, but they're not. I, I talked to somebody with her herbarium the other day. I said, well, what do you think the difference is between the serum and Hexastylus? Oh, well, well, Hexastylus have an annulus. You're joking, right? An annulus means there's a little ring right there. I said, when is that enough to separate a genus? That's not even enough to separate a species. Maybe a variety on a bad day. But I'm sorry, you don't get a new genus because of an annulus. It doesn't happen. So these are serums. I'm sorry if there's some hexastylus hold on to holdovers out here in the audience. But what an incredible plant. This will be coming into bloom in the next week or two in the garden. It's just truly amazing. The native iris cristatus, native all through the southeast and northeast, just amazing uh, forms, just, just an idea of the different forms here. Just incredible, just about four to six inches tall, getting ready to come into full bloom in the next few days, extraordinary. And then you go down further south, the native Louisiana iris are just incredible. Iris fulva, one of the five species that make up the Louisiana complex. Just an amazing, amazing plant. If you live long enough in the wild, you'll find even yellow forms. Like this wonderful one selected in Arkansas. And then when you breed them together, which you actually will happen on its own, but the breeders get hold of them, they create this. Some of the best of our native Louisiana iris have been created in New Zealand. This is wrong on every level. <laughs> This one, this one, I mean, they, they create it and they send them back here. They're incredible. Look at, look at the colors. All made by five naturally interbreeding native Gulf Coast species. Everybody should be growing loose hands. These things will grow in six inches of stand in water or they'll grow in dry ground. I can't imagine not growing loose hands. The, the orchids. I grew up thinking orchids were hard to move until I went out with Margaret and we found that yellow leaf slippers actually move really easy. Pink ones, not as easy. There's a little problem there. But all these other species, they're incredibly easy to grow. Superpedum kentuckiense grows fabulous here. Almost two foot tall is extraordinary. They're now produced from seed over in Germany. It takes eight years from seed. And we're able to get these in now and make them available. And no, in eight years, they're not cheap. They never will be. But they are very easy to grow. The Cypripedium Kentuckians. And there's our native Cypripedium Harborflorum variety pubescent. This is the, the type that we used to collect out at South Hills. Extraordinarily easy. Get over the idea that lady slippers are hard to grow. They're not. Just don't put the roots down like you normally do a plant. Normally you put the roots like this. No, lay slippers out. Lay it flat, cover it with some soil. That's the key. Very easy to grow. Our native spiranthes organs. Oh my God. Flowers in September and October. Extra beautiful vanilla fragrance. Easy as can be. I, I'm driving through Texas one day, and this is like mowed lawn everywhere. And we get out to look around, and there's spiranthes growing all through the mowed pastures. <laughs> No, this is seriously easy to grow. Oh, the native jack of the pulpits. In flower now. Get out in the woods if you haven't. These are amazing, amazing plants. All kinds of neat forms you find if you look around. Like this beautiful one found up in Virginia by my friend Paul James. Isn't that incredible? Look at the leaf pattern. It comes true from seed even. Or this form found down in North Florida by my friend Bob McCartney. This is one we named Blackjack. Incredible. Keep your eyes open. There are all these incredible garden forms just waiting to be discovered out there. And then ending up on trilliums. I, I, I listened to a lecture years ago, the late Fred Case spoke to our rock garden chapter on trilliums. Three hours on trilliums. <laughs> I could probably do three hours now on trilliums. I will not do that to you tonight. But I was just blown away at the diversity of the group and how little 
that was available. The only trillion, I remember as a kid going out about trillions at Kmart when I was probably six years old in the little bag, and of course, they all were dead. They were dead when they were put in the bag, or shortly after. Yeah, if you hang up in Kmart for two months in a plastic bag, you're probably not going to be in particularly good shape either. And so I was fascinated by Fred's lecture and then later getting his book and realizing that all the trillions that people knew were from up north and down south. We had this whole wealth of trillions that nobody knew or nobody paid any attention to. And so we began going out, studying them in the wild, bringing back samples. We bring back one plant out of a specimen and then grow them from seed. And just sharing with you some of those tonight, Trillium fetidissimum from down in the Mississippi uh, area, incredible. One of the best ever for us. This, this starts flowering for us in February with the hellebores. Beautiful plant. Trillium gracile from uh, Louisiana into East Texas. That's one clump in our gardens. This big, that's a hundred stems in that clump. How extraordinary. Trillium ludovisiana. It's just different forms. Now that was more typical, and this is what we look for when we go out. This is one we've named Raging Cajun down in Louisiana. <laughs> Extraordinarily plant, multiplies very fast. So we're able now to not only do them from seed, but do clonal selection that multiply well. Trillium cuneatum, my wonderful uh, native here in North Carolina, it's on <laughs> I-40. If you dare stop in the middle of the road, just <laughs> jump off, you get to see them right along the highway. Pretty incredible about the middle of the state. The variation that we find is extraordinary. Just same species, just look at the variation. Now that one originally down in South Carolina, we now grow these from seed, the silver one comes true found that in a while. How's that? Nine leaves. That's a nanillium. <laughs> and flowers. Just incredible. We find yellow flowered forms or purple trims. All trillings. All the sessiles. And sessiles means the flower sits on the leaf. That normally are in purple. We'll always find a yellow one, a silver one. Maybe one in one and a half million. And then we grow those from seed. Trillium lancifolium. Isn't that crazy? Found that in a patch of poison ivy up at a rest stop, a truck stop, and a uh, swampy truck stop in Tennessee. Extraordinary. Multiplies well. You go from one stem to 50 in just a matter of a few years. Same species. This is it growing in North Florida, where it has flowers that age to this beautiful yellow. Same species, but variation. Trillium Underwoodia, oh my God, from North Florida into Alabama, one of the most beautiful species ever. It's incredible. Look at the variation in that. Yes, I know, hard stand still. When you come up on one of those, it's like, wow, that's just so incredible. Or finding this one, as I found roadside, just this double decker with six leaves, just, just absolutely extraordinary. Or this beautiful golden flowered form of the same species, Trillium underwoodia. So how do we grow them? Seed. Four to seven years. We can flower a lot of them in four years. So here we are in seed pods. They're all started there. Some germinate in a year, some take two years. Transplant those into here. We've got now over a, two, or a half acre of nothing but trillions. And then once they're ready, we're able to, to share those. Because we feel like these things are great garden plants, and it's sort of you know, our time to help get those out. We'll do it for a while, and then we hope those of you that get them will begin to share them with other people. One of the neat things with doing this is you start then being able to create new plants, being able to create new hybrids, because you're bringing genetics together that never existed together. This is one of our crosses with, with the Trillium cuneatum and Trillium maculatum. Nothing like this ever existed before we brought them all together and put them in one place. It's so exciting now because there, there's so many things still out there that we haven't found. I, I, when I was in school, I was very naive. I, I thought all species had been discovered. Then I come to find it. We haven't even found the stuff in our own backyard. There's been six new trillium species discovered in the last 10 years within five hours of Raleigh. 
Think about that. This one right here, Trillium Lustinia. You know what it was found? It was found on Interstate 20 in South Carolina across from the McDonald's. <laughs> the only place in the world it exists. How in the hell did we miss that for that long? It's absolutely crazy. It's phenomenal. We're growing this from seed. We've had it for about 10 years. I've got probably another couple years we'll be able to finally make this available. So it's not a fast process. You know, God knows, don't start a nursery to make money growing trilliums. <laughs> Trillium telmacola exists on one site, the nuclear plant in Georgia. The only place it exists. One population. Wild hogs got into it last year. Last time I heard there was 12 plants left in existence in the world. 12. We were able to get one. We now have one in our garden. I know there's one in South Carolina. There's one other that's out of the site. But we don't know that there will be anything left because the nuclear plant people have no interest in getting rid of the wild hogs. In fact, they don't want anybody on their site working to do anything, but we, this is safe now, but it's not going to be safe in its site, only ex situ conservation. Uh, small little thing, but in the pusillum group, but then winds up about 18 inches tall when it finishes growing, so quite extraordinary. Trillium Jones Gap, this is a new one, hadn't been named yet. It's similar to Kate's B.I., but the DNA shows it's another new species, completely different. And does very well in this area where we'll eventually get that. It'll probably take us a decade to get that propagated from seed and get it out, but it's coming. Another new one, Trillium Tennesseans. A friend of mine, the UT Herbarium, gets a call two years ago. A couple bought, bought a retirement uh, house and or building a house out in the woods and photographing the wildflowers. One of my deeds sent this picture to this herbarium. He's like, son of a gun, that's a new species. Goes out, did the DNA on it. It's now published Trillium tennesseeans. Brand new species. Very similar to Ustigia, which you saw earlier, but it, it definitely just got several pretty distinctive characteristics. 1998. I'm just getting into my Trillium phase. So I've got the two new Trillium books, and I drive up to Tennessee, and I get out around Lookout Mountain, and I'm, and I'm sitting there in the car, and I'm looking, and I'm like, wow, look at the Trilliums. I said, this, the guy was with us. I said, there's two species out here. Let's figure out what they are. So we get our books out. One of them was easy. We knew Trillium cuneatum. Get the other one. Oh, there's only one species here. Well, that certainly is not the same thing. So we got a plant. We dug it up. We took it down to George. Drove it right down there to the guy who wrote one of the Trillium books, Don Jacobs. I said, well, John, what is this? I said, where'd you get it? I said, that's not in your key. <laughs> You tell me what it is, then I'll tell you where it is. Oh, oh well, well, it, uh, oh, God, it, well, I, uh, um, God, it looks the closest to Trillium Ludovisiana. I said, well, yeah, it does a little bit, but that's only in Louisiana. We got this in Tennessee. Can't be, can't be, can't be. <laughs> well, it's it's in the works to hopefully be published as a new species, Trillium Freemanite. Keep your eyes open when you're out there. We have only begun to touch what is right here in our backyard. And again, I encourage everyone, grow these things that happen to be in your backyard. Not because they're better adapted, not because anything likes them better, just because they're great plants. And at this single point in time, they happen to be in our backyards. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Tony? Okay, yes. Why do some plants grow turf of seed and others don't? Ah, great plant, great question. Why do some plants grow true from seed and some don't? It depends on the pollinator. It depends on where they're isolated. If you, for example, collected Trillium cuneatum from a particular population, they would grow true within what the genetics of that population are. When you bring a plant into your garden, 
if you have it close, for example, trilliums. Trilliums are pop, pop, pollinated by gnats, pretty much. And if you have two trilliums close, but the gnats can go from one to another, they will cross the two trilliums. Same with other plants. If you have plants that are wind pollinated, like pines, and you have them close enough, and they are genetically compatible, they will cross. So it all depends on the isolation and the pollinator as to how they will come through. For example, these yellow trilliums, what we found is if we isolate those, those will come very true to color. Even though the normal is red, those genetics will come very true. But if we put it beside a red one, we will get a much less percentage. So it really does based on the pollinator and the location. Great question. Other? Yeah. Are you still growing the um, Aniscanthus pumpkin pie or uh, something? No, nobody bought it. I did. <laughs> yeah. You're that one person. It looks beautifully. I know. It's, it's a nice orange color. It's one, of the frust orange. it's one of the frustrating parts of doing this is you supposedly everybody's into native now. Well, I'm sorry. We don't find the sales there on most of the things. And it's a shame. We're going through the catalog right now. We're going to take out probably 500 items that simply don't sell. And it hurts me because I want these plants to get out. That's, you know, that's my goal in life is to try to force these plants down people's throats. <laughs> this is a really cool plant, damn it. Grow it. <laughs> but when that collides with the realities of trying to run a business, uh, it's very frustrating. So, you know, y'all can all help spread the words that these are really cool plants that need to be in people's gardens. And yes, it's a hard sell when you're competing with pansies and petunias and the stuff you find at the box stores. You know, 60, depending on the estimate, 60 to 80% of the plants sold in America now are sold through the box stores. You're never going to find a lot of these cool plants. Yeah. What was the name of that plant that had the bloom with the red base and the yellow top? Uh, Spigelia marilandica. Yeah, called Indian pink. So, that's one here again everybody should grow really easy. Are you having, yeah. better, you having better luck with them growing in the pots? I tried to get that from you last year and they said when they were growing in the pots they were having a hard time with them. Now it's not a hard time in the pots. It's, it's a, a lot of our natives have really funny ways of it's how they form buds. For example, if you've got a stem that comes up and your leaves come out, and your leaves come here, and then you have a flower, if you root it, a lot of times there's not growth buds in these leaf axles. And when you plant it, the plant will grow fine just the next year, you're left with roots and no top because you had no crown underneath the ground. So a lot of that is how the plants are potted and how they are propagated. Many of our natives, Jopawi the same way, Baptisias are the same way, Spigelias are that way, many of our natives, you have to root them. On, on the Spigelia alabamensis I showed, we have a two week window we can get cuttings out of the year, out of 52, that's it. Anything out of that two week window, you might get it rooted, but you will have no overwintering. So we got a good crop now. That, that's just a propagation issue. The spigelia is mostly done in tissue culture, but you still, when they're planting them, they got to get them deep enough to get one to two nodes under the ground. So that was a propagation issue. Great question. Yes. Um, how did you plant some milkweed this year? That yeah. The monarchs. Does it matter what kind of milkweed? Well, different different monarchs like different kinds of milkweed, but but all the Sclepias are good. You know, and, and that's an interesting debate I had the other day that, uh, you know, there's a lot of publicity now that the monarchs are dying out because we don't have enough asclepias. Now, as a nurseryman, I love that. <laughs> Reality is, populations spike and wane. Uh, I, I, I remain unconvinced that that is due to all of a sudden, it's not like farms have expanded in the last five years, ten years. Um, I mean, we've lost a lot of stuff to agriculture and a lot of the pesticides now do take out some of the milkweed. So yeah, as a nurseryman, I love that, but yeah. 
Yeah, so just plan planning. I mean, you know, the best ones uh, around here, be careful with milkweed, because they're, they're clumping milkweeds and they're seriously weedy milkweeds. I mean, really weedy milkweeds. Like, will take over your garden and you will never get rid of them. Yeah, be careful with uh, some of the Asclepius, like Syriacus and Purpurescens and uh, Tuberosa is a good one. They, you're always safe with Tuberosa. That's just such a great plant. You find it native all around Raleigh. There's still some native down near us. Uh, on the way home, we'll pass it. It's just, just a great plant. Again, if you got prairies, then the running ones are fine. Yes? Uh, back to the monarchs. Yeah. Was this a uh, uh, low year for monarchs with you? Because where I live at Whitaker Glen, yeah. I did not see one monarch this year. I believe we had a couple last year, but no, it's definitely, they've been in the way. There's no disputing the fact that we have not been seeing them. But everything, you know, every insect out there goes in cycles. Uh, a few years ago, we were having a problem with uh, a Baptisia caterpillar just eating the Baptisias up. We've never had any problem with Baptisia. That lasted four years. <coughs> They're gone. So, so all insects, everything in nature is cyclical. Uh, this, this idea that some people have that nature is static and nature should always be exactly the same and these people want to preserve one point in time that they consider ideal you know 1492 was perfect we have to preserve that point in time it's it's not real so yeah so I, I'm, I'm not convinced that monarchs are declining but anything we can plant again it's all about this is where Doug and I do agree biodiversity is the key plant as much as you can plant this these monocultures and this you know, most houses in Raleigh have eight different kinds of plants at the most. It's insane. You know, we're currently up to, we're up to just over 22,000 different types of plants on our property. I mean, that's a little extreme, but that's what it is. <laughs> so somewhere in between would be fine for the rest of you. <laughs> Any other? Yes. There are quite a few native plants that are deer resistant. I don't have a list in front of me, but if you go on our website, we've got a great uh, going to plant articles. There's a whole article on a deer resistant. I mean, certainly ferns are fabulous. That's why ferns are grown so much now. Uh, deer really do leave those alone for the most part. Uh, you know, others, uh, deer love. You know, trillium populations have been decimated absolutely decimated across the country. You go up on the parkway now, you, you find very few trillions. It's, it's unbelievable because we've let the deer get so out of control because nobody wants to hurt Bambi and <laughs> killing our understory. Really sad. Question? Uh, are there any Baptisia cultivars that rebloom during the season or that missing when one time? All the Baptisias so far are spring bloomers. Uh, well, well, okay. Or not re-bloomers, I shouldn't say that. There are Baptisias that bloom during the summer. Uh, Baptisia rachnifera is a great summer bloomer. Uh, Baptisia... Uh, Simplicifolia, thank you. Uh, is another great summer bloomer. That doesn't even come up till July. Which is really weird. Simplicifolia is native to the panhandle of Florida, and yet it's the latest Baptisia to come up, which makes no sense. But yeah, those two are summer bloomers. So we're we're trying now to cross with Baptisia rachnifera, and we made some crosses last year. We'll see if we get any good hybrids. But that would be neat if we could get that to happen. <laughs> All it takes with breeding is one breakthrough. You may have failures for years, but if you get that one breakthrough, then that leads to a whole other series. A lot of possibilities. So we're really excited about the possibilities. Any others? Yes? Do you um, see anything to what I hear about the zone crease, that our zones are moving? Yes. Uh, do we hear anything about zone creep? Well, certainly, as we talked before, what's what climate does? It changes. 
for those that, that don't actually pay attention to real science, we've been glaciated 17 times. <laughs> okay, that's a lot. We typically, over the last thousand years, if you look, we go 15 to 20 years up, 15 to 20 years down, 15 to 20 up, 15 to 20 down, with a general upward trend. The majority of the time Earth's been here, we've been on average 25 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than we are today. That's normal. So we actually, we've only been this low twice, now and back in the Carboniferous period. So we are generally heading up, absolutely, without question. So yes, uh, if you look, the last year we had below zero in Raleigh was 1996. So we went on this wonderful upward trend and everybody was growing things that were out of zone. And then all of a sudden, about that 17, 18 year mark, a couple years ago, we started getting cold again. And if you believe in history, we've got the next 15 years, we're going to be on a cooler trend. So yeah, absolutely. There, zone creep is a real thing. There, there's, you know, people, people have very short memories. 1984 in Raleigh, we hit minus 9 Fahrenheit. Every comedian in Raleigh was killed to the ground. Everybody said, I'll never plan another comedian. <laughs> Yeah, how's that working out for them? <laughs> yeah, it, no. Again, that's what climate does. It changes. So we have to be adaptable to it. Yeah, plants moved. If you look at historical records, plants have moved all around. There's a wonderful book called Ancient American Forest. If you haven't read this, it's a really neat book about America. And it's uh, Tom Bonickson. And he's, he spoke here once. And he's an amazing guy. He's like a founder of the Sierra Club. He testifies before Congress. He talks about how America has really changed, what plants moved, where they moved, when they moved, why they moved, how they reestablished. It, it's, it's really an extraordinary thing. I mean, you look at Hemlock Bluff's classic example. You know, plants moved down uh, to get away from the glaciers, got hung out to dry, and they were like, oh, north side, Hemlock Bluff's pretty cool. We'll just hang around there for a few thousands of years. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, always. Climate's changing, so some people are adventurous, some people not. Okay, thank you very much.